basically, you know, I had asked when I became interested in film, asked my family what was the name of the first film I ever saw. And they said, uh, the first film you ever saw was The Color Wheel. Or, and I said, okay. And then 15 years later, I thought, I should look that up on IMDb. And I did, and no such film with that title existed. And um, I thought, that's confusing. And for me, just kind of, and, you know, it's important to me to have a unique title that no one's ever had before. But then, um, you know, I'd, I'd felt for years that this movie was a part of my life. And then it turns out that it wasn't. And I felt like, you know, the film was kind of about spending a lot of your childhood and your adulthood believing one thing and then finding out all of a sudden that it's not true. So it seemed very appropriate to me. And, um, yeah, so it seemed like an appropriate title. And furthermore, you know, a lot of the films and books that inspired it, um, you know, I read a lot of Philip Roth to think about this film. And I feel like the syntax of that title fits in with it, you know, the ghostwriter, the anatomy lesson, the professor of desire, the human stain, the dying animal. It just kind of follows that same structure that he always uses for his titles and uh, it seems spiritually connected. And, uh, you know, it doesn't, it, it's the title. It means, it, it means something to me. You have nine new voice messages. First voice message. Hi, Colin. It's your favorite sister, JR, calling. Give your sister a call back. I need your help this weekend, so give me a call. Message erased. I think we wanted to go down there and concentrate on the breeze and the pina coladas and not your emotional turmoil and your pathetic, shambled life. You're such a jerk. Next message. Give me a call back. I really need to talk to you. I have an opportunity for you that involves carrying stuff to help me move. So it should be really, 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 really fun. I'm going to keep saying call me back until you call me back. So call me back, call me back, call me back. Message erased. Auditions take a lot of time. It's yeah, a lot of time. A couple nothing. hours a day in between all the daydreaming and the napping. You leave I your house three stuff. days a week. I got news for you. Well, I don't know why you think you're so special. Because I everyone am in special. the world. I don't know why you think you're so special that you don't have to work and everybody else does. Next message. I can't seem to get you over the phone, so I guess I'll just tell you here. I am moving out of the professor's house. But yeah, it's not working out with him, and I need to get my stuff out of there, and I need your help. I have a lot of stuff that I need to move out, so I'm hoping you can come with me and drop me to his house uh, on Friday. I hope that works for you and your horrible schedule. Message erased. It's nice of you to come help your sister. Based on what she said, I assumed you two didn't have a very good relationship. Someone should write a case study about you guys. Like you, like the victim of circumstance, you. Yeah, your yourself. difficulty would I don't know. come from your overwhelming lack of experience with child psychology and your relative slight experience in journalism and broadcast. Asshole. Right. Next message. Hey, Colin, I got your message. It's great. You can come help me. Get ready for the best or worst weekend of your life. Message erased. End of new messages. I had made my first film in 2009, and I was out there with it, and I kind of started to feel like, I was very confused all of a sudden, because all these people who I had gone to school with, or gone to film school with, who, you know, we'd always discussed all these dreams that we had, and all these projects we wanted to do, and then all of a sudden, I, I had done one, I had done exactly what I wanted to do, which was making this film, and I started noticing that very few other people had, you know, kind of followed through on what they what they wanted all these goals that me and my friends had spent hours talking about I was the only one who well, not the only one but you know most people I knew weren't still chasing the same dream that they were when they were younger and uh, that became very confusing to me and then I kind of connected with Carlin because she was in another film called you won't miss me that I had seen and liked and um, I kind of brought this idea to her and she really all responded to what I was saying about feeling like other members of our generation had kind of failed to fulfill all this potential that we felt they had had. You know, these beautiful, creative, wonderful people that her and I had known by the time they were in their early or mid-twenties, they just weren't inspiring us anymore and they weren't... Um, you know, following through on, on what they had always dreamt of doing, and that became very interesting to us both. I mean, everybody was encouraged to contribute, and uh, Bob Byington, the actor who plays the professor, contributed a lot of ideas to the character. Um, but I mean, Carlin and I wrote the entire script, um, and you know, 
encouraged contributions from people. I, I see a lot of films. You know, I see a film almost every day in the theater, and my cinematographer sees even more. And um, but you know, when we've made these two films of mine, we don't talk about a hundred movies. We don't talk about fifteen movies. We really just only talk about one or two. And we were talking a lot about Jerry Lewis. Um, there was a retrospective of his late films in New York around the time that I was finishing up with the first draft of the script. And, um, you know, it was just unbelievable to see these films. And the influence on them was huge. And Jerry is one of my cinematographer, Sean's favorite directors, and one of my favorite directors. And he's just a real artist. And uh, the pathology of the way he made his films you know, the presentation of a film written and directed and produced by this one man who then plays six or seven roles in the film, you know, that's not a joke. There's something very interesting and something very resonant about that that I really responded to. And um, obviously, you know, the actual humor of his films and the Pratt Falls and the jokes are second to none. But more than that, you know, the, the resonance of the psychology of him as a director was very inspirational and you know just anything goes with him there's nothing that no idea is too silly for any movie and no idea is too complicated just anything anything goes and that was something that was really important and um yeah i mean with john Eustache, you know the mother and the horror is just is essential and i've seen it many times and you know it's a black and white beautiful film that you watch it and you feel like they were just making up the dialogue as they went along and then you find out it was just very scripted every every word and um you know anything like that where you can present a film to people that feels so natural that they assume that you were just rolling the camera and then they find out that you know you spent a year writing it is very interesting and you know the and then as well that film i think you know draws to a very admirable conclusion that when you know hopefully like with with the color wheel, if you see it a second time and you know how it ends, you feel very differently about what happens to the characters. And yeah, just, you know, very, very important films like that. Carlin and I sat down for several months and um, we kind of talked about the characters and we talked about where they'd come from and what they were doing with their lives and just how they acted. And then we, once we had that, we kind of thought of a, a, a story for them knowing, you know, we knew the story, but we had to think of how much scenes would be, how, you know, where they go, who they encounter, what happens to them. And then we took that, which was, you know, an outline, and I wrote a draft of the script where both characters had my voice. <clears throat> and then I gave it to her, and she rewrote everything for her character, and that was the second draft. And then that was in November, of 2009 and then we shot in June of 2010 so just from November until June we were just rehearsing two or three times a week and just rewriting while we were rehearsing and you know she would say I think we need a scene here that is very embarrassing for my character and then we would add that um, you know she'd say we should just add a quick scene where I run into an idol of mine and she humiliates me and then that's just a quick addition. But all in all, we ended up having about seven or eight drafts of the script. And yeah, we just rehearsed a lot in order to have that rhythm because, you know, shooting on 16 millimeter and lots of back and forth, and you can't really improvise that. It really, you have to know what you're saying and you have to know the material. And um, yeah, it just takes time. It just took six months of rehearsals to, to nail it. I mean, for us, this is not even really a choice. You know, my cinematographer, I mean, he does everything. He does fiction, nonfiction, video, film, 16, Super 16. And his preference is for, is for 16. And uh, my first film was 16 millimeter. And, you know, I brought him the script and we were talking about it. And, um, you know, I said, I've never acted before. <clears throat> I'm afraid I'm gonna waste a lot of film and it'd be very expensive. And he said, well, let's talk about, you know, what is, the, what is the tone of this? And I, you know, I said, well, you know, this very classic sense of America, motels, diners, the highway. And he said, you know, well, that needs to be in black and white. You know, there's no, you can't go to a diner and shoot in color 
that doesn't trigger any emotional response for anybody. If you show somebody a diner in black and white and it's grainy and it's film, now all of a sudden people are thinking of something very specific and something very outdated and they know that that's a choice. You know, you shoot it on video, they think that's just what people do. But you shoot it on film, that's a choice. You shoot it on black and white, that's another choice. So just right there, you're looking at every scene and the way that we shot it, and it's just it's just decisions that were important to us. That, you know, once we had that two-minute conversation, they weren't even decisions anymore. It was just obvious that it was just obvious that it had to be 16, of course, and it had to be black and white, and um, it just became, you know, part of the language of the film. I mean, we knew the arc of the movie, and we knew the ending, and we knew how we felt about the characters, most importantly, and we knew that we knew where we wanted to leave the characters off at the end of the film, and we just needed to construct the script to service that. You know, we needed to make a film that starts with two people who you are told are related, who can't stand each other, and we knew what had to happen to them at the end and just everything needed to push them together. Every person they encountered, every character they spoke to needed to just push them closer and closer together until you know they realized that nobody in the entire world will have any, any tolerance for either one of them except each other. And that you know they might not be perfect, but they're the best they've got. And, you know, that was always part of it. And everything from the script, every draft was just getting to that point. I guess objectively they probably are not cool because they're very awkward and they both are, you know, they, they can't integrate into, a, into society and they can't have friends. So in that sense they are, but I think both Carlin and I felt a lot of sympathy for our characters and we never wanted to make fun of them and part of the reason that you know we wrote these roles for ourselves and you know I decided <clears throat> that I needed to play it myself was so that people watching it knew that well the the director and the screenwriters of this film clearly care about these characters because I wouldn't give the character my face if I wanted everyone to laugh at him and think he was a loser I'm putting myself out there obviously you know that's asking the audience to sympathize with the character a little bit and depict him, you know, he's not a triumphant character, he's not he's not popular, he's not successful with women, but he he says what he feels and I find that to be admirable and he's not going to be he's not going to be, you know, submissive. He walks into a room and so does Carlin's character, you know, they walk into a room and they say what they feel, they make inappropriate remarks and they offend people. And that to me is a very proud characteristic and you know a, a sign of somebody who is very very confident and very interesting out I mean yeah outcasts loners miscreants but losers that would imply that they're that would imply that they're competing I don't think either one of them cares about about competing with these people yeah they're just time I mean, they're timeless I mean that motel is from the 70s hasn't been changed at all the diner is almost as old and um, you know I mean that's another choice that we're making you know we're doing the film a modern film made by young people there's no cell phones in it there's no computers there's nothing so you know part of that is building the atmosphere in locations like that and you know the I saw the photography exhibit when we were writing the film of Robert Frank's The Americans and it just you know changed everything for me because it was just so powerful and the imagery in it was so evocative of an era that I never knew and also completely timeless and that was exactly what we wanted and you know the street corners in that and the the diners and the motels and his photographs you know they're gone they don't look like anything but then when you find a place that looks a little bit like it instantly you're back there and that was very interesting to me and um, yeah, just all those locations, just they could exist anywhere. They could exist at any point in the last 40 years. I mean, you know, that the hotel is on the side of the road in New England, and the room looks exactly like the room that I'm staying in here. You know, it's just the same type of room. It's the same size bed. It's the same brown and white um, interior, the same 
ceiling with brown strips of wood on it and uh you know it's just it's just anywhere and it, it, it exists at the same time and i wasn't sure about that i wasn't sure if you know to me that's a joke about you know religious people in weird parts of america but i was told that there are weird religious people here as well yeah, sure. so everywhere <laughs> yeah so i think perhaps that that is understandable but we put in a a photograph of the pope from the 50s on the counter and I realized yesterday I said that might mean something to people here that might be the Pope people here grew up with yeah, yeah. to us it was just a joke yeah. but that might be the Pope that people had hanging up in their house when they were a child so yeah, maybe it was, yeah maybe it was a little bit offensive but I mean Impelex like the color wheel takes a situation that's not naturally funny you know it World War II a soldier looking for rockets and missiles is no more obviously funny than two people who don't like each other at all being forced to spend time together. <clears throat> but I think I wanted to find some comedy in that and find the smallest possible way to tell a very big story. And, um, you know, it is all handheld, so perhaps people feel that it is mockumentary-like. But, um, you know, I think we approach the material very similarly. But that was very different. I mean, that... You know, we only had a 20-page script. Oh. Not because there was improvising, just because there's no dialogue in it. Yeah. Um, so in terms of that, it couldn't be more different. But, you know, it was a challenge to make Impelex because, you know, it's a 20-page script and I'd never made a film before. And then it was a challenge to make this because it was a 110-page script for a movie that ended up being 80 minutes long. And I, you know, I had never done that before. I mean, Impelex only has five characters in it. There are shots in Color Wheel with seven people you know a, a shot that has more people in it than my entire first film so it was just a different challenge and i don't think i could have gotten to color wheel without impel x and uh they're very connected for me at the moment it's very difficult to think about that because um this movie took a really long time and it was very complicated and very emotional and um more importantly it just i was doing it very i mean i didn't really have a producer i was making every phone call every dollar I had to find myself and I don't think I'll be able to do another film until I have you know somebody working with me to help create something much larger and get some money and get some actual resources in place so that I'm not just asking favors of people um, but I will you know hopefully soon I will find that person and I will find those resources and they will enable me to make something much larger and much uh, much more mannered that I really can take my time with and you know, 